people, I think we're, uh, I think we're going to start. I am Chance Gardner. I'm the writer and producer of Magical Egypt, and I think I'm in the show somewhere. I'm here with a man who is just one of my favorite people in the world, and for my money, one of the most important scientists of our generation. He's a man that ranks, in my mind, up there with Oppenheimer and, um, and some of the more important, and Albert Hoffman. Uh, he has been present when a door has opened in the human experience that not only shed new light on the functions of the pineal gland in the brain, but really opened a door in our understanding of consciousness. Rick Strassman's original book, DMT, The Spirit Molecule, outlines one of the bizarrest events that ever happened in human history. And it was a very important uh, bit of science because it was one of the few times where someone was able to do uh, structured, rigorous scientific tests on live DMT subjects. And what was discovered about consciousness and about DMT, uh, it may be centuries before it's fully sorted out how important that was, but it feels like we've all been living in a little closet and we just found a door and that door opened to a much bigger room and made us realize we've been living in the closet this whole time instead of the luxurious living room we have. Rick, what an absolute pleasure to spend time with you again. Thank you for joining us. Well, thanks, Chance. Yeah, we were talking, you know, before we started that the last or first time we all got together was at the La Brea Tar Pits, one incredibly hot June day in L.A., uh, you know, for one of the earlier Magical Egypt uh, episodes. I remember there was a little bird that was parked next to us and would not leave us alone and was just at maximum volume chirping the whole time. And I had to resort to throwing right. my water bottle. Remember, I disrupted the sanctity of our shoot because I threw my water bottle at this poor uh, bird. Well, you know, that clip is one of the most popular clips of me giving any kind of exposition on YouTube. So uh, oh, it's, awesome. it's got legs. It's got legs, baby. So do I. I'm going to stand up and show them to you in a minute. We'll get into the conversation some more. <laughs> um, so can you tell people, just in case there's anybody who doesn't know, um, what is DMT? Uh, well, DMT stands for dimethyltryptamine. Uh, it's a uh, it's a very powerful, you know, psychedelic you know, substance. Uh, and uh, one of the most interesting things about it is it's you know formed in the human body um, as well as being present in you know, hundreds, if not you know, thousands, of plants. Um, it's a uh, you know tryptamine hallucinogen or you know psychedelic. Uh, it's a chemical cousin of melatonin and of serotonin, and it activates a number of the same receptors which you know serotonin does. Um, and uh, I was interested in it because uh, of its possible relationship to non-drug, you know, highly altered states of consciousness. Uh, which resembled those, you know, brought on by, you know, psychedelic drugs. Um, I was, you know, thinking if, um, you know, if naturally occurring DMT plays a role in dreams or near-death experiences or mystical states, that giving DMT would replicate certain, uh, you know, features um, of those, of those non-drug altered states of consciousness um you know but the study which i performed in new mexico at the time was you know more of a straight you know forward psychopharmacology you know project uh it was the first new study in this country in over 20 years you know so it you know, had to be uh you know couched in fairly straightforward meat and potatoes kinds of terms like you know dose response and you know, neuroendocrinology and autonomic, um, you know, parameters, those kinds of things, you know, um, you know, but at the same time, you know, my deeper motivations were to characterize the state as carefully as I could and, uh, you know, to make comparisons where they were relevant. Rick's book, his first book was called DMT, The Spirit Molecule. And it was to this day one of the best books I've ever read because not only was it a very rigorous scientific um, coverage of a very important moment, but also there was the stories of the subjective experiences of the DMT patients. 
And if you are a, a connoisseur of the surreal, if you are a Terrence McKenna fan, if you're a person who's ever wondered about the psychedelic condition, the stories that Rick's patients, uh, the Rick's subjects came back with were remarkable, uh, bizarre, bewildering. Some of them were horrific and frightening. Some of them were quite beautiful. They all had this thing in common that they were all, well, there was a couple of people that had no response at all, but primarily the people literally left the physical space they were in, traveled to another space that many of them report was as real or more real than their normal reality. But the subject matter, hyper-intelligent bees talking to them. Um, in one case, one of the subjects had this horrific experience where he was raped by alligator people. Um, maybe that was David Icke, now that I think about it. Raped by reptilians. Um, <laughs> um, no, no, David wasn't a volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> we'll protect his anonymity, even if he was. <laughs> but anyway, those subjects, that, the, the thing that made the book so interesting to me, I still remember that you italicized the, um, the stories, the subjective stories, but they were so interesting and so bizarre. Uh, and I can say for my part, it certainly started a uh, bonfire of interest for me in, in the DMT book and the DMT experience. And then Rick was able to get this amazing book um, adapted to film, and he did a uh, film, which I believe is still on Netflix and hosted by uh, the iconic Joe Rogan, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's a hugely popular video, or it's a hugely popular independent documentary. Yeah, it streamed a lot on Netflix. Um, yeah, it got the story out to a lot more people. You know, a lot more people prefer watching things uh, than you know reading. Uh, I occasionally, you know, get emails from you know people saying, "Well, I don't normally read, but I read your book, so that's always a strong endorsement." <laughs> One of the reasons why I, um, in a lot of ways, ruined my life to take some time off and adapt John Anthony West's book uh, in, in, into this project that became Magical Egypt is. I knew so many friends that I wanted to talk to about this book, and nobody I know reads anymore. And so if I wanted to have a conversation about this book, I felt like I'd had to um, adapt it, and uh, certainly not anywhere near the scale that uh, your DMT movie was. But it's such an important thing. And, um, you know, speaking of Joe Rogan, he brought this, you know, he's sort of a Pied Piper of people and demographics that might not have ever come to this stuff before. and he was instrumental in really opening up. Um, he was very kind about uh, Magical Egypt, but uh, he really, well, you know, he participated so much in your project that he really did help bring this subject matter to people who are not big readers. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, uh, if you look at Joe's main, uh, you know, demographic, it's, uh, you know, UFC and Fear Factor, uh, Fox Sports, stand-up comedy um yeah you know so he's been quite instrumental in getting the word out there um yeah i met joe once we had coffee in la and uh uh yeah he's you know just a normal regular guy in person uh and uh he really loves dmt and he loves altered states and he loves uh spiritual topics so uh we were thinking he'd be a great uh, you know, guy to narrate the film, and uh, it turned out to be the case. Yeah. It was a perfect match. Uh, it was extremely well done. My compliments again. So after DMT, The Spirit Molecule, you've written a new book. Uh, it's a few years later. This new book is called DMT and the Spirit of Prophecy. Tell us a little bit about that and about uh, how it, uh, well, first of all, uh, how, it, how it came about and uh, what, what it meant to you. Well, um, you know, I've completed my study a long time ago now, 23 years ago. Uh, you know, 1995, I gave my last dose of DMT or anything, really. Uh, you know, we were also, you know, giving psilocybin in uh, some, you know, dose, you know, finding studies, uh, which we could return to later, maybe. Um, <clears throat> but one of the main questions I was left with was, you know, how do you explain the DMT effect? Um, I was uh, not really that, you know, satisfied with the kinds of models that I had brought to bear uh, on the study originally, which were the, you know, psychopharmacology model, you know, this is your brain on drugs, 
or the you know Zen Buddhism model, which was the spiritual you know tradition out of which I approached the study, which you know treated the phenomenon as illusory, you know, like a hallucination. Um, and uh, you know the other model that I had brought to bear was the you know psychoanalytic, which uh, was more of a uh, way of interpreting the phenomena, you know, rather than explaining, you know, how they came to be. So, uh, you know, one of the most striking aspects of the DMT effect with the doses that we gave people was the feeling of reality. Uh, it was more real than real for a lot of people. And the other thing which was unexpected was the interactive relational quality of the trip. Um, it wasn't the light, light, ego free, you know, uh, you know, wordless, um, you know, uh, you know, merging, you know, with the one, uh, it was extremely interactive, you know, give and take questions and answers, things, you know, being done to the volunteers, volunteers doing things to the you know, contents of the DMT world. You know, so uh, I went back, you know, to the drawing board um, <clears throat> after the study ended and, uh, you know, looked into some of the, you know, new you know, physics kinds of ideas, dark matter, parallel universes, those, you know, uh, you know, kinds of, you know, conceptual models, you know, you know, but even though, you know, it is, you know, theoretically, speculatively, you know, possible to explain, you know, the mechanisms perhaps of, you know, DMT interacting with the brain to modify consciousness, it still really didn't get to, you know, what I was interested in, which was the meaning and, you know, the message, you know, the relevance of being able to enter into these states, what these states meant, what they're good for, um, you know, what can we learn from them. Um, you know, so I thought I would then kind of, you know, shift my emphasis, you know, to the more spiritual, you know, traditions, which are also interested in, you know, usually invisible, uh, you know, worlds. Um, you know, they've been studying them for a long time. You know, so I, you know, had, uh, I think, you know, taken, you know, Buddhism, at least, you know, Zen Buddhism about as far as I could. Um, <clears throat> you know, shamanism uh, is got some strengths, especially regarding, you know, the reality of those states rather than them being, you know, you know, purely, you know, hallucinatory, you know, but, you know, shamanism has got its own, you know, problems and shortcomings. It isn't a, you know, Western, you know, tradition. It isn't, you know, um, it isn't, you know, theistic. Uh, it, you know, is, you know, more spiritistic. Um, it, you know, emphasizes, you know, the spirits, you know, rather than, you know this the overarching organizational intelligence that you know created and you know regulates those spirits in other words you know there's no god in you know most you know forms of shamanism um you know so you know it was around that time that uh i ended my relationship with my zen community um and that you know provided an opening for me to return to you know, to my Jewish roots. Uh, so I started, you know, reading the Hebrew Bible. And, uh, you know, as I entered into it, you know, more deeply, uh, I began to, you know, perceive this thing, you know, called, you know, prophecy, you know, the prophetic state, uh, which is very much phenomenologically like the DMT experience. It's, you know, fulsome, you interact with things it's more real than real and it also has got you know the advantage of being on the western model um you know so the language and the concepts uh aren't especially you know foreign you know like you know buddhism might be or like you know shamanism might be um it uh it you know it uh it is encompassed or it's encased in uh a um you know, foundational Western text, you know, the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament. Um, and, you know, the Old Testament is the you know, foundational, you know, book of, of, you know, Western civilization. Um, our kids are all named after, you know, biblical you know, figures, our you know, theology, 
<clears throat> is you know biblical, you know philosophy, economics, you know politics, um, ethical, you know moral structures, uh, you know language. It's all you know based on the Bible. You know, so it was you know kind of a gold mine in a way, you know, because it's a spiritual you know text whose you know seminal experience is like DMT and you could use it or at least I started using it as a key to interpreting what you can extract from the DMT and other psychedelic states. I can imagine this is a highly contentious subject and when you bring in Judeo-Christianism and especially when you hybridize it with a subject like the hallucinogens uh, I can imagine you've got some blowback on that. It drives people crazy, um, is what it does. Uh, yeah, you you would not believe the blowback, and it's you know blowback from the people that you would least expect it. Um, yeah, yeah, it's really kind of you know funny in a way. Well, if it weren't so you know sad, it would be funny, right? Uh, you know, like uh, like a few years ago, I was invited to you know give a TED talk at one of the local chapters, and you know it was in a hip California community, and uh, you know so I spoke with the host and said, well, you know, what do you want me to talk about? And he said, well, I'd like you, you know, you know, to talk about uh, you know psychedelic drugs, you know, you know, but this was just a few years back, and. Uh, uh, you know, my book on prophetic states had come out in 2014. You know, so um, I said, well, you know, I've kind of, you know, veered into the more spiritual. And uh, he, he said, oh, that's great, great. You know, most of the people in our group are Buddhists. So uh, um, I said, well, you know, that's, you know, that's good. I have a lot of experience in you know, Buddhism, you know, but I've kind of, you know, gone more into the Jewish um, stream of things. And he said, oh, that might be a problem. Uh, so I said, you know, why? And he said, well, you know, the Bible, Judaism, Palestinians, Israel. And I said, well, you know, you, most of your uh, people in your group, you know, the Buddhists used to be Jewish or they still are Jewish. They, you know, converted or they, you know, call themselves Buddhists now. You know, so what's the difference between, you know, Buddhism and, you know, Judaism? You know, they're both religions. And uh, he said, no, no, you know, Buddhism isn't a religion. Uh, so, you know, it got, it, you know, kind of, you know, degenerated, you know, rather quickly. Um, yeah, you know, so it just didn't quite work out. Um, I've heard you, know, you but say, also, uh, I've um, heard you say familiarity breeds contempt, that because this is this thing that we all know so well, and we want something exotic. In fact, I think I heard you mention in the 60s when people first started doing LSD, everyone was really interested in the Tibetan Book of the Dead and I don't want to say scavenging, but searching for through the Eastern uh, Library for insightful new bits of information. Um, as a result of Magical Egypt and the study of symbolism, I've kind of come around to at least recognizing there's uh, some really universal symbols in the Bible that exist in all the sacred tomes. And, but I can certainly see how, uh, for a lot of people, the last thing they would want to sign up for is to sit and talk about uh, biblical stories. Uh, where I accessed it was anybody who's had the DMT experience or most of the entheogenic experiences, especially for artists, they're such a source of epiphany and revelation. They're not only self-revelation, but something I hope to talk to you about today is that there is this voice of the other. There is a feeling anyway that, you know, maybe impossible to prove, but there's some fairly simple protocols that Terrence McKenna developed where you can do these simple tests to say, is this coming from me or is it coming from outside of me? Um, you know, in dreams, when you pick up a book that you've never read before, there won't be words there that you've never read because it's not in you to project in the dream. And Anyway, it always interested me the question of whether this was a phenomenological, a subjective experience, or whether it was an objective experience, something that was real and that actually existed. And in Magical Egypt, one of the things we talked about in labeling all of these people, including yourself, part of the new counterculture is there's this fundamental disagreement about the nature of consciousness. Is consciousness entirely physical and entirely uh, limited to the, you know, to your, um, that pink sponge? 
or is an idea more like Rupert Sheldrake's idea that your head works more like a radio or uh, there's a frequency reception thing? Do you have a leaning one way or another? And did DMT give you an indication one way or other about that mystery of consciousness? Well, you know, that's a huge question. And um, it's just, you know, so complicated. Uh, you know, I, I'm beginning to look at the, you know, psychedelics. And, you know, this is like a very, you know, dense, you know, summary, which could require, you know, hours to unpack. But uh, I think what, you know, psychedelics, you know, do is they act as, you know, super placebos. Um, and, and, you know, that they, you know, do through stimulating the imaginative, you know, faculty, you know, the Aristotelian imaginative, you know, faculty. Well, Aristotle uh, separated intellect and imagination. Is that right? Mind and imagination. Right, exactly. Right, exactly. Yeah, you know, so, you know, the imagination is anything which isn't conceptual. You know, so the imagination is, you know, feelings and you know, physical sensations and emotions and perceptions. Um, and, you know, the intellect is the, you know, part of the mind which, you know, deals with abstract ideas. Um, so I think, uh, you know, if you look, you know, carefully at the, you know, psychedelic state and its content, um, I went back and, you know, looked at my, you know, case reports, you know, not that long ago, you know, because, um, you know, you can call, you know, psychedelics by all kinds of things. You can call them psychedelics, you know, mind manifesting or mind disclosing. You, you can call them, you know, psychotomimetics, you know, they mimic psychosis. And if you give a rating scale, question and answer, paper and pencil rating scale, which, you know, measures, you know, psychotic symptoms, you give DMT and the scales are quite high or the scores are quite high, which indicates, you know, to that kind of a research model, you know, DMT, you know, mimics, you know, psychosis. Um, on the other hand, if you prepare people and you coach them to have a mystical experience um, and you give them a questionnaire which indicates, you know, mystical scores you know i'll be darned scores on the mystical experience questionnaire go through the roof too you know so are these drugs you know mystical mimetic are they psychotomimetic um or are they psychedelic and i think you know psychedelic as mind you know manifesting um you know captures the placebo uh you know power of these drugs and you know that isn't to say that, you know, placebo is fake. It means it's just, uh, you know, something which is, you know, mediated through the, you know, psycho, you know, physical entity rather than, you know, purely the mind or, you know, purely mm. the body. <clears throat> you know, so in our volunteers who were just told it's really fast, it's really intense, it's over quickly, you may think you've died, but you won't. Most likely, nobody ever has, and if any you know problems arise, you know we'll be here to help. You know that's the only coaching that we did, um, and you know lo and behold, everybody's experiences was just a magnification of who they were. Um, uh, you know the shamanic, you know people had shamanic experiences. The people with uh, interest in religious experience, you know, had a mystical state uh you know those with you know social activism kinds of ideas uh you know encountered episodes or an example of the golden rule um you know so it was just you know more of who they were and it was much more convincing and much more real than what they had experienced before you know, one of the examples I like to bring up in this respect is that of, you know, Charlie Manson and, you know, his, you know, followers. Um, you know, his, you know, volunteers, you know, so to speak, were, you know, sociopaths. You know, they were violent. You know, they had an axe to grind. They were kind of confused. You know, their identities weren't that well formed. You know, so, you know, Manson, 
you know, kind of gave them LSD. Well, he didn't kind of give them LSD. You know, he gave them LSD. A lot of LSD. Um, and a lot of LSD. And, you know, he took smaller doses. Smart. Uh, and he just, you know, uh, instructed them on this, you know, helter-skelter model, which was that there's going to be a race war. The blacks were going to win. The race war was going to be triggered, you know, by these murders that you know he and his you know followers were going to commit. Wow. And after the race, you know, war was over and the blacks, you know, won, you know, because of you know their superior um, intelligence. You know, Manson was you know going to be the leader of this you know post you know this you know post apocalyptic you know society. And you know, lo you know, and you know, after a while. This um, indoctrination started to work, and he turned these people into, you know, serial killers. You know, so you know, none of his volunteers became monks. You know, you know, none of them would have, you know, called these drugs entheogens. And in the you know, same way, you know, nobody in the mystical experience or tobacco using or alcoholism studies are going to become, you know, serial killers. You know, they're going to be, you know, self-selected individuals to volunteer for these studies because of their interest in certain things, becoming healthier, becoming more, you know, creative, speeding up their spiritual, uh, you know, training or development. And they'll be coached along the way. They'll be given 8 to 12 hours of, you know, psychotherapy, which would be called indoctrination because it's a way of, you know, looking at the state and, you know, how to deal with it when it comes up. And they'll be given questionnaires which tap certain things and they have goals which they wish to attain. You know, so uh, it's, you know, you've got, you know, the you know, Charlie Manson model on one extreme and you've got the mystical mimetic on you know, the other stream and you get what you're looking for. You know, so, you know, that's why I think these drugs are, you know, psychedelics as opposed to entheogens or psychotomimetics or what or um mystical or you know mystical mimetics you know so you know that's where the you know crucial ingredient comes in you know which is uh you know the pre-existing you know character of the individual and the orientation the education, you know, the in you know the indoctrination, as it were, you know, you know, uh, the exposure to the doctrine uh, through which you're going to be um, interpreting and integrating the experience uh, itself. It sounds like that what you just said has a lot in common with the death experience. I think when we first talked, when we did the magic, magical Egypt originally, you'd said something that really impressed me that during moments of stress, um, this DMT drip will happen and the most stressful uh, moment that you're going to have is at the moment of death when you have this massive flood of DMT. And so it's hard to not equate or uh, look at them in conjunction, the DMT experience and, and the death state. And what you just said, I suspect, has a lot to do with the death state, what you expect to happen your conceptual framework and the way that you've been patterned and programmed and just the kind of person you are, the religion you belong to and what you expect to happen to you after death may very well be what happens to you. Uh, I think that's a very interesting thing. And so artists and people that are prepared, shamans that show up, um, there's a huge neo shaman culture in Australia and there's a lot of really responsible people who understand the importance of fasting and preparing yourself and coming at the experience with a uh, clear head and nothing weighing you, you know, nothing hanging over your head. And, and all of those things that you would expect a real religious or shamanic experience to take place in, responsible use of entheogens, like Aldous Huxley said, they're not for everybody. Timothy Leary thought they were for everyone and was quite vocal about that. And Aldous Huxley, um, Caution and said, absolutely, there are certain stratas and types and professions of people that are going to do fantastic at this, but you don't want policemen on this. You don't want big truck drivers. You don't want machinery, saw operators. And so uh, context, in fact, it reminded me of another wonderful thing that I just heard you say recently about set, setting, and the drug. I know you said this a long time ago, but finish that sentence. You know, well, set, setting and drugs, yeah. only one is not necessary? 
Right, right. Yeah, of the three legs of the tripod of the drug experience, drug, you know, set and the setting, you know, the one that's you know, probably the most dispensable is the drug. I love um, that. You know, be, yeah, yeah. I it's mean, so much can, what you bring uh, to it. It's so much right, fun. and Sorry. you know, you, you, I mean, you can't, you know, get to the same place uh, without drugs. I mean, that's kind of unlikely, kind of unreasonable. You know, like, you know, one of our volunteers, or actually, you know, more than one of my volunteers would say, "Well, you know, can't you, you know, get here with meditation or some other ways?" And I said, "You know, good luck." Uh, you know, compared, you know, to the you know full-on big DMT experience. But still, I, I mean, depending on the kind of person you want to be and, you know, how you want your relationships to be and how you want to, you know, feel about your world and yourself, you know, the, the, you know, the things you read, the things you think and the people you're around and your behavior on a day-to-day, -day, you know, basis, you know, those are, you know, the real, you know, tests. It isn't... Uh, you know, how, you know, high you've gotten or what kind of extreme states of, you know, consciousness you've attained. Yeah. For an artist, um, for me in particular, I guess all I can talk about is myself. I've always had this feeling of diving for pearls that when I was younger and my first attempts to stop watching television, I found that I would start doing the same graphic design or the same animations over and over again because I wasn't exposing myself to new visual stimuli. And then the moment anyone has a DMT experience or an entheid, you know, an LSD experience or a mushroom experience, it's so attendant with this type of visuals and this art direction that literally doesn't exist anywhere else. And most people, when they've been faced with something like that, come back and say, well, there's no way I could ever reproduce that. I've been studying this and attempting to reproduce those moments in this way, like diving for pearls. You know, you dive way deep underwater and you try and bring something back, you know, and the value, at least for artists, for creatives, and I'm sure for uh, psychologists and people mapping out, you know, the inner terrain, there is legitimate, genuine new information that comes from these things that is quite revelatory. And I absolutely got that anyone who's had this experience, if you're of a certain mindset, you're going to come back with stories to tell. You're going to come back with inspirations, with epiphanies, with revelations, slightly less so in the DMT experience, but some of the longer lasting, like the ayahuasca experience or mushrooms. And so I so understood the logical progression from your first book to your second book, because as long as people have been around and as long as people have had a pineal gland, we've been having these unexplainable experiences with epiphany and revelation. And the fact that we live in this culture that really is built upon this book, that it's a collection of stories of people interacting with the divine is extremely profound. Well, yeah, well, uh, the, you know, there's a lot there. Um, you know, the question of the, of, you know, the pineal gland is, is, is an interesting one. Um, you know, I proposed a long, you know, time ago that I believed it was, you know, possible that the pineal gland made, you know, DMT. You know, but it's been, you know, known for years, you know, for decades, you know, since, you know, the 60s, actually, you know, that the lungs make DMT. You know, so, you know, the pineal story was, yeah, yeah, that is very interesting. Yeah, you know, so the pineal story was, you know, kind of the cherry on top or the frosting on the cake, as it were, you know, you know, um well, because, you know, people, you know, can live normal lives, you know, without a pineal gland. Uh, if it was destroyed by a stroke or by a tumor or a big, you know, cyst, you know, needed to be removed from the pineal, uh, you know, by and large, uh, you know, people without pineal glands, you know, live normal lives, you know. So, you know, the pineal story is an interesting one, but it isn't, you know, crucial, you know, to the issue of what's the role of endogenous, you know, DMT in, you know, normal consciousness and altered consciousness. But, you know, nevertheless, um, you know, five years ago, a group um, at the University of you know, Michigan in, um, uh, um, in Ann Arbor, you know, discovered, you know, DMT and the pineal gland of, you know, the living rodent. You know, so that's, you know, been established, you know, that, you know, the pineal gland 
um, in a living mammal makes DMT. Um, you know, so the same group is um, actually, you know, looking for, you know, DMT in the brain itself, you know, the frontal lobes and, you know, the visual lobes and those kinds of things. Um, and also, you know, uh, you know, for the, uh, well, you know, so they're also, you know, looking, you know, for evidence of, you know, the, uh, you know, the building, uh, you know, blocks, you know, for DMT synthesis uh, in the rodent and, and in the human brain. Uh, you know, so they've got data, uh, and they're really strong, um, you know, data, which are, you know, now, you know, being looked at, you know, for publication. You know, so we will know, you know, more, you know, gradually, you know, you know, you know, slowly, but, you know, surely about the, well, the presence and, you know, other role of you know naturally occurring DMT in uh, you know the human brain you know the human uh, you know central nervous system. One of the many ways that this intersects with ancient Egypt is um, very much like the Bindi you know the third eye dot in Hinduism. Um, in Egypt, there's this fantastical emphasis on the third eye, you know, where the uraeus emerges from this third eye, um, and some of the people, some of the really interesting people that have contributed to the show, there's a kind of consensus that what is actually considered the third eye is the trinity of the pituitary, thalamus, and pineal gland. And uh, there's some really interesting stuff out there about how if you cut the brain in the middle and you look at the diencephalon, the cross-section of the diencephalon looks exactly like that Egyptian eye, the eye of Horus. You can find those comparisons all over the internet. But as an artist, I, I talk with this a lot about the other people that I'm doing the show with, and there's something to be imagined, not the imaginal landscape, but the landscape of the imagination and the mind's eye. They call it the mind's eye. You know, in the Western world, it's called the mind's eye, and I think it's very much akin to this idea of the third eye. I've been very interested in, you know, the way Viagra, everyone knows what Viagra does, that these entheogens seem to be like a Viagra for the imagination, that it makes imagination visible. For me, my experiences have always been very visual and very seldom have I had a linguistic content or have I actually talked to somebody. What kind of research did you do in studying, um, in, in, in researching for your prophecy book that seems to be much more linguistic um, communications? Um, well, you know, well, yeah, well, that's an interesting analogy, you know, Viagra for the imagination. Um, I would say like a, a, a steroid for the imagination, uh, you know, but, you know, it's, you know, the same, you know, the same idea. It's, it's, it's an amplification, uh, a stimulation, a, you know, magnification uh, of the imagination. Um, well, I think most of the information that, you know, the West, you know, so far is gleaning from the psychedelic state is from the realm of the imagination, uh, m you know, music and art as opposed to, you know, new ideas. Like, um, you know, the ideas that my volunteers, you know, came back with, you know, the notions, you know, weren't anywhere nearly as well, you know, formed and as, you know, well um, articulated as you know, the descriptions of the state itself, which were, you know, more, you know, perceptual and emotional and, you know, physical, you know, the kinds of, you know, contents of the imaginative, you know, faculty um, of Aristotle. You know, but the ideas, you know, they didn't come, you know, back with anything, you know, you know, nearly as, you know, well articulated, you know, from the abstract, you know, conceptual world, you know, you know, so in other words, you know, you know their, you know their intellect, you know their rational faculty wasn't stimulated, you know, nearly as much as their imaginative was. You know, so I think one of you know the reasons you know that's the case is because of you know who they were and you know what was the contents of their you know rational faculty. You know, so that's the importance of study and of you know thinking and of, you know, talking and to, you know, develop a vocabulary 
which you can then use to extract the information which occurs in the imaginative you know realm um, I think what these drugs do is they make you know visible things which are normally invisible uh, and uh, what you then you know need to do is extract the information that is you know you know which is made visible and you can only extract that information using your intellect you know you know what are these you know symbols actually you know representing you can draw the symbols and they inspire you and you you can resonate with the state that in which the symbols you know manifest you know you know but if you want to you know share it verbally um then you you know then you need you, you know the vocabulary Language. you yeah. need the notions interesting uh, that when you're is, you know, yeah when you're interacting with alien beings, with intelligent bees, with living architecture, the DMT experience is so bizarre and whatever it is that you're interacting with has so little to do with our common experience that I can imagine people coming back from that and literally not being able to do anything with it because what do you do with that? There was a giant bejeweled cloud that was trying to trade geometry with me. There's no language for that. On the other hand, when you talk about prophecy, um, a burning bush that gives you a message or these epiphanies. Every artist, every creative, every problem solver has been to a place where you had to dig deep. Um, for me, I call it identifying one of the many voices in my head. There's this voice that always knows <laughs> what to do. It, it never volunteers information. I have to work for it and sweat for it, but it is this voice of epiphany that always knows the perfect creative solution. When you were researching prophecy, I imagine what what led you to the instances that you studied? I, I I don't want to say burning bush again, but there's the Bible is literally full of people who were inspired by a divine revelation. Is that where you're? Well, reading? yeah. Um, well, I started off just you know making uh, uh, you know comparisons. Uh, yeah. You know, phenom uh, you know phenomenological comparisons between the DMT state. And the prophetic state, um, you know, lots of people think of you know prophecy as you know foretelling or predicting the future, but you know that's you know more of a you know that's you know more of an artifact of the Greek translation of the Hebrew word for you know prophecy um, into uh, you know kind of you know divination as opposed to uh. an interaction with spiritual you know levels of reality. You know, so I define your know, prophecy in a lot, you know, broader, you know, sense than mo most people do. Uh, you know, which is, you know, just any spiritual experience as described in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, it could take, you know, it, it you know, can occur uh, in any figure. It wouldn't have to be one of, you know, the canonical prophets or, you know, Moses or, you know, David or Adam or Eve or Abraham. You know, it could be a you know foot soldier. It could be uh, you know, like a, you know handmaiden. It could be a slave. It could be anyone you know who encounters an angel, encounters God. You know, has a you know dream which uh, foretells the future. You know, there is you know foretelling in the Bible and in you know the prophetic experience. But there's a lot of prophetic experience which is you know free of any foretelling or you know prediction, and even in cases where there is foretelling or you know prediction it's quite you know hard oftentimes you know to interpret what those predictions actually mean um you know have they come true they're you know kind of allegorical and you know some ways you know they're hard to understand um you know so you know using an enlarged you know uh you know definition of the prophetic state i started scouring the text for any spiritual experiences uh which uh, which would occur in any of you know the figures uh, in the Hebrew Bible, you know. So I, you know, bend the experiences as uh, as you know laid down in uh, the text, and uh, was really struck by the overlap between the you know phenomenology of the DMT state and the prophetic state, you know. But there were. But, you know, there were, uh, you know, disconnects, you know, you know, the overlap, you know, wasn't, uh, you know, perfect. And, you know, one of those, 
you know, disparities between the two states was the quality of, you know, the interactions uh, in the, you know, DMT volunteers as compared, you know, to those in, in the, you know, prophetic state. You know, the interaction between the experient and the contents of the state were, you know, quite, you know, fulsome, quite complex, uh, quite, you know, prolonged uh, in the, you know, prophetic experience as compared, you know, the, you know, to the DMT state, which was a, you know, a bit more, you know, haphazard and piecemeal, you know, so that was, you know, one disparity between the two states. And when you look at, you know, the interaction, well, you know, what is the, you know, function of, you know, that interaction in the prophetic state? And it's to exchange information. It's, you know, to communicate, you know, verbal data. You know, so then, you know, that started leading me, you know, to, well, you know, what is the verbal data? You know, you know, what is, you know, the information which is, you know, contained in the prophetic state, which is gleaned through a more, you know, muscular way of interacting with, you know, the contents of the prophetic state. You know, like if you read accounts in the Bible, you know, the prophet is confused and says, what does this mean? And, you know, so the angel will, you know, say, oh, you know, don't you know what it means? And the prophet says, no, I don't. Explain it to me. You know, so that is a you know, good way of, you know, learning how to interact with, this, with the, you know, psychedelic experience through, you know, gaining some, uh, uh, you, uh, well, you, you know, through gaining some, you know, familiarity with, you know, the Hebrew Bible text. You learn how to question, you learn how to answer, you learn how to negotiate. Like, you know, for example, uh, you know, Abraham is, you know, arguing, you know, with God, you know, concerning, you know, the destruction of, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, so, you know, you know, so Abraham says, well, you know, how about 50 righteous people? Will you spare the cities on account of the 50? And God says, okay, on the 50, you know, if I can find, you know, 50 righteous people. You know, so Abraham says, you know, you know, maybe there's only 45. And, you know, God says, okay, you know, 45. You know, so it you know, goes all the way down to 10. You know, so if you're in a DMT state and you want some information, you want some help, you have to learn, you know, how to, you know, barter, you know, how to negotiate. You know, Terrence would, you know, talk about that a lot. Yeah. You know, you have to learn how to barter. Um, and, you know, that is, a, you know, for lack of a better word, a, you know, biblical notion. Um, but you uh you you use your mind to get the most information that you can out of any you know particular interaction uh you make plans and you strategize and you adjust yourself depending on the result um you know so those are all things which are useful you know tools uh in interacting with you know the psychedelic state guys i'm going to interrupt you for one second chance Please. we've got um 10 minutes to go right. for the hour. And right. so, okay. um, guys, if there's any questions, uh, please type them now. I have one from Robin. I'm not really clear what he's asking, but I think he says, what is the difference between DMT from the acacia and mimosa wood? Do you have any idea about the difference between those two woods, Mello? Um. Well, DMT is DMT, you know, like, you know, vitamin C is, you know, vitamin C. Uh, it could be, you know, made in a laboratory. It can come, you know, from an orange. It can come, you know, you know from spinach. Uh, and it's, you know, the same with DMT. You know, DMT is a, you know, relatively small, you know, simple molecule. And, uh, you know, if it's pure DMT, it's pure DMT. Um, you know, so I think with respect, you know, you know, to the different, uh, you know, the different, you know, botanical, you know, sources of, um, you know, DMT, that's, you know, more of a question of, you know, the other, you know, you know, compounds uh, which are in the plant, you know, but if you've got, you know, 99.99% pure DMT, um, it can, you know, come from any plant, it can come you know, from a laboratory. You know, in our case or in our studies, um, our, you know, DMT was made in a laboratory. Fantastic, Jalen. Okay, so Anne would like to know what exactly does DMT do in the body? Do we know which organs it interacts with? Well, we're just 
still, you know, learning about what is DMT, you know, doing in the body, either, you know, naturally occurring or after it's been given to, you know, people. Um, it stimulates, you know, certain, you know, subtypes of the serotonin receptors, you know, the 1A type and the 2A type. Um, it also, uh, you know, seems to, you know, protect, you know, it, it also, you know, seems to protect, you know, nervous tissue against, you know, damage from conditions of, you know, low oxygen, you know, so, you know, that's been, you know, leading, you know, people to think, well, is, you know, DMT, you know, neuroprotective in, in you know, conditions of, you know, low brain oxygen, which is occurring when you're dying, obviously, and, you know, perhaps elevated levels of, you know, DMT are, you know, are, you know, released, you know, both to uh, protect the brain and, you know, failing that, you know, to usher consciousness out of, you know, the body as you're dying. Um, it also, you know, seems to, you know, have some anti-inflammatory effects. Um, so, you know, I think as, you know, time goes on, we're going to learn, uh, you know, more and more, more um, about what, you know, DMT is doing uh, in, in uh, the body. You know, it's a ubiquitous compound, you know, found, you know, it's, you know, found all, uh, you know, throughout nature. Um, fish, sponges, humans, plants, you know, so, uh, you know, it's uh, extremely old, you know, compound in the evolutionary ladder. So uh, I think it may, you know, turn out to be, uh, you know, completely important in, you uh, you know, nature and then, uh, uh, amen and consciousness. It reminds me of something I heard you say that was super interesting. Uh, and it reminded me of something Terrence used to tell a story about, I don't know if it was DMT or what it was, but there was a, one of the drugs was originally called telepathy back in the forties. And that the researchers that discovered it had such a ubiquitous experience of consciousness merging or Terrence called it boundary dissolving. It was a very cool thing. I'd heard you talk about, well, in, in, in Terrence and in, um, not that Carlos Castaneda is a, is a, is a good source, but uh, things containing DMT can talk to one another. That's where I'm trying to get to. Uh, first of all, telepathy. Do you know that word telepathy? Remember yeah, yeah. Well, you know, telepathy was what they called one of the compounds they extracted from ayahuasca, you know, back in the day. You know, so it, you know, turned out to be one of the beta carbolines, which are uh, important in allowing oral DMT to become active when you drink ayahuasca. So yeah, all those you know, shaman so stories. Was, uh, those shaman stories where the plant told me, you know, how did you learn how to make this compound? The compound, the plant told me, and all of those stories. And I'm, you probably noticed this. It seems that all of nature can talk to one another, and we're the only ones that are left out of the conversation for some reason. But it was an interesting idea that you were exploring that anything that contains DMT might be able to talk through the commonality of DMT. Right, right. I've, you know, coined the expression, you know, spiritual Esperanto, you know, like a universal oh. language, which uh, is, you know, shared by any, you know, organism which, you know, contains DMT. I, I mean, obviously, you know, that's, you know, beyond a, uh, a step into the speculative, but, uh, you know, it's a uh, you know, fascinating idea to, uh, to consider. Rick, that actually, I'm going to ask a question now, <laughs> if I may. Um, you talk about in your book that there is a different caliber of information that comes through prophecy, which is more of a top-down level of information, and the information that people are experiencing when they're on DMT, which is kind of their seeing unseen internal information, information that is, is within their own heads, if you will. So one of the questions that we have in Magical Egypt is how did the ancient Egyptians have all of this phenomenal knowledge, like astronomical knowledge, cosmological knowledge? And what I'm wondering is, given that there is a difference between a kind of a shamanistic knowledge and a more of a prophecy model, would you say that this caliber of information that the ancient Egyptians were reaching, would that be more of a prophecy or more of an internal kind of information? 
Well, you know, the, I suppose, you know, uh, you know, the proof is in the pudding, right? Uh, mm. You know, if the information is true and, you know, valuable, uh, you know, that's probably the most important thing. Uh, you know, there's a, you know, concept or, you know, there's a, you know, discussion which was engaged in by the, you know, you know by the, you know, medieval Jewish, you know, philosophers, you know, I mean, you know, with respect to, you know, the location of, you know, that information, you know, so does, you know, prophecy, you know, um, is the prophetic, you know, is the, is the act of prophecy, which is, you know, considered to be a outpouring or an outflowing, you know, from God, you know, you know, does the outflow, you know, contain the information? Um, or, you know, does the outflow then make, you know, visible um, information which is already in, you know, in our own, in our own minds, in our own, you know, consciousness, you know, but is buried and, you know, requires activation through the attainment of the prophetic state. Um, you know, in a way that's kind of splitting hairs, uh, I just don't think we'll ever know, at least not for a long, long time. Uh, I think, you know, um, well, you know, there's another, you know, concept uh, which was developed, you know, by the philosophers, but which can be, you know, gleaned you know, from the text, which is the notion of true prophecy versus false prophecy. Wow. So, you, you know, uh, and, you know, there's descriptions of, you, of, you know, how you can, you know, determine what's true prophecy as compared to false prophecy. Um you know, it isn't, you know, cut and, you know, dry. Uh, there aren't any, you know, completely black and white criteria. But, you know, you, you know, look at the character of, you know, the person. Um, are they, you know, dissipated or are they virtuous? Mm. Uh, you look at the nature of, you know, the information. Uh, is it useful? Is it true? You know, does it, you know, promote peace or does it, you know, or, or you know, does it, you know, uh, encourage strife um you know so in the in the you know case of the information about the uh you know the natural you know world uh you know i think that can be attained through inspiration you mm -hmm. know uh, spinoza uh or i guess you know spinoza and his you know precursors like you know you know you know like maimonides and uh you know, his, you know, colleagues described that there were two, you know, ways of understanding the world. You know, one was through, you know, scientific study, and uh, the other, you know, um, was, you know, through revelation. And, you know, revelation is, you know, quicker. Uh, <laughs> it just is you know, downloaded all of a sudden. Um, and, you know, then you've got the laborious work of I'm untying all the knots and understanding what it was that just you know, happened to you, as compared you know to, you know to the you know scientific you know model or the you know scientific uh, you know method of you know doing um, empirical studies, w w which will lead you know to the same thing ultimately. You know, one is painstaking and you know logical, and you know the other is inspirational. You know, um, you know, so you know the two ought you know, so the two ought to be, you know, complementary. They, you know, shouldn't be in opposition to each other. If, you know, they are in opposition, um, you know, to each other, you know, then that opposition ought to be investigated. And, uh, you know, there ought to be, you know, humility uh, when one, you know, side is, you know, proven wrong. Fantastic. I mean, I think that really helps me at least put that in perspective because when you look at the information that is derived in the pyramid for example that is true and beautiful <laughs> you know what i mean and it's it's lasted for that long so that definitely gives me an indication of where that came from rick i want to say thank you so much it's been the hour i think we've answered all the questions chance do you want to make any last comment um yeah if you don't mind are you good for another minute or two rick sure um, we did, a, in our episode three, um, I believe it was episode three, we did some research into the hypnagogic state, 
I know that you are a um, psychiatrist or a psychologist. Uh, are a psychiatrist. You really, psychiatrist, sorry. I, one of these days I'll learn the difference between those two. Um, yeah, I went to medical school. <laughs> <laughs> I know because one of them gets mad when you call them the other, and the other one's um, complimented. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you study young? And where, where I'm getting to with this is um, I found a tremendous number of parallels between people describing the hypnagogic state and people describing the DMT state. Hypnagogic state is this incredibly bizarre state, and oddly enough, involves a lot of the same mechanisms. Um, you know, that are involved in sleep. There's a special kind of sleep that's not quite asleep and not quite awake. Um, and Jung talked about in his Red Book, and a number of other people, Swedenborg and this person, uh, Wilson Van Dusen, who's very interesting, study this phenomena of the hypnagogic state, and it is another thing that seems to point to an exterior, real, live, objective place that you might, I hate to use, ridiculous words like astral travel, but your consciousness becomes untethered to your body, seemingly, subjectively, it seems like that. And I guess we may never know. That's a million-dollar question. It's impossible to answer uh, with any kind of absolute certainty, but it sure appears that there are places that aren't physical that could be visited by one's awareness. That it, Ontological reality, as uh, Gary Lachlan and a lot of people say, and so I couldn't help but notice. And the, you know, it raises the same question: Is this really real? Am I really traveling to this place? Is my head like a radio, and I'm just changing my tuned-in frequency? Um, wh what is your take on Jungian, um, well, Jung's Red Book and uh, the hypnagogic state and the imaginal realm? Uh, yeah, you know, lots of people. Yeah, you know, um, I often get emails from, you know, people describing very DMT-like effects of the hypnagogic experience. And, you know, that wouldn't be that, you know, hard to study to determine if endogenous DMT is involved. Um, you could, you know, look at the activity of the genes responsible, you know, for the enzymes that make, you know, DMT. Are those genes more, you know, turned on? in the hypnagogic state as compared, you know, you know, to normal consciousness. Or you could give DMT to, you know, people with, uh, you know, pronounced uh, experiences in that state and, you know, compare them. Like, is the DMT state, which I'm giving you now, you know, like your hypnagogic state, which, uh, you know, you've experienced on your own without drugs. Um, you, you know, whether those worlds are real or not, you know, there is a, a speculative, you know, notion one could, you know, toss out there, which is the idea of a dark matter camera or a parallel universe camera, which is able to take snapshots of those parallel levels of reality as articulated by modern physics. And you could, you know, take a picture and you could say, well, is it like this? Uh, you know, that's probably a few, you know, thousand years in the future, but, uh, Still, I, I mean, it wouldn't be, you know, it isn't completely outrageous to imagine, you know, that you can, you know, photograph or, you know, somehow capture images, you know, from those, you know, levels of reality that we are, you know, learning about, which are occurring all the time around us uh, that we just can't, you know, perceive normally. Wow. Well, Rick, thank you so much for your books. Thank you so much for your service to humanity. I have such a good time talking to you. It reminds me, uh, there are people out there who don't speculate. I love talking to you because you don't speculate. You're, <laughs> you're a true scientist. <laughs> uh, I try, yeah, yeah. It's, you know, tempting, though, to speculate. It's, you know, fun to speculate, but you ought to be able to, like, you know, distinguish between the two. That's where it gets a little tricky. But, uh you know, thanks very much for having me on your show, Chance and Venice, and uh, until next time. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Darlin. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you, participants, for showing up as well and enjoying this wonderful information. Um, we'll see you soon, Rick, and we'll see you guys later tomorrow. <laughs> thank you so much.